Just before we get started today, I do want to say that this episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. I'm going to tell you a bit more about them in just a bit. And now today's video. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as ever, am your host, Simon. Thank you for being here. I mean, you're not really here, but you're listening or you're watching this show, and I'm grateful to you for it. Uh, David wrote today's episode. It's the Rostov Ripper. Butcher, sadist, savage. You might be wondering, normally, if you're uh, if you're watching this show, if you're not one of our uh, podcast listeners, hello to everyone, equally, by the way. Uh, I'm reading this on my iPad today. I had no intention of recording this video today. Does anyone else find that? Like, I've got an internet provider that uh, was fantastic for many years. Brilliant. Just super happy, super fast, reasonably priced internet. And then, like, last year, they were bought by... Yeah, I'll tell that. Yeah, it's Vodafone. Those heads at Vodafone, allegedly. They're like, they bought this company and it just became shit. And it's like, my internet's way slower. Uh, definitely not anywhere close to the advertised speeds. Thanks, Vodafone. And also, they're, this week, they're just like, you don't need the internet in the afternoons, right? You just need it in the morning. You don't need any afternoons. I had a whole bunch of other stuff that I was going to record today, but it had lots of French pronunciations in it. And uh, I was like, well, I need, I need the internet to look those up. Otherwise, I mean... It's just not going to go well. And uh, so instead, I'm reading this script. And I hadn't printed it out. I'm reading it on my iPad. This is not interesting to anyone. I just felt the need to vent. <laughs> because, god damn it, internet service provider. What are you smoking? It's not okay to just have hours of outages in the, in the middle of the day. Several days in a row. It's just not cool. It's just not cool at all. I, I need the internet for work. I mean... It's costing me a lot of money not having the internet. <laughs> it's very inefficient. Okay, stop ranting, fact boy. And get into it. Thank you, David. Let's go. Oh, Jen as well. Don't forget me. Jen is our video editor, audio editor, master of the universe. Thank you, Jen. Let's go. As redundant as it may seem to issue a content warning on a true crime podcast. Oh yeah, I got an email from David who was like, dude, this one is insane. <laughs> like, this one is going to make you in a bad mood. And I was like, yeah, that sounds perfect. What I need is like uh, two things ruining my day. Horror and my internet service provider. What's the difference? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, brilliant. Especially since my previous entries contained bushland torturers and Italian cannibals, this case is in this case in particular is not for the faint of heart all information will be conveyed carefully and matter-of-factly out of respect for the victims and in condemnation of the man who carried out these horrific crimes please note horrific is not an exaggeration it is an entirely accurate description you've been warned it almost proved too much even for me opening up this script is like opening up the gates of hell oh god there is actually one script that i have not made it through in uh the history of scripting and reading scripts and i've covered like joseph mengele the nazis genocides lots of true crime but there was one which was talking really specifically about some like nazi crimes where they experimented on humans and i got about five minutes in and i'm just like i'm out <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm out on this 100 percent out on this like people might get you know this is a good piece of history to share but as i can't do this I, it was just like I, it ruined me for days and uh so i just i just didn't do it just didn't do it let's carry on oh i hope it's this <laughs> i hope this is one of those times <laughs> gotta power through it it's it's also i find it somehow easier when it's not industrialized when crime is not done by a nation but rather a psychotic individual i find it easier to swallow I don't know what that says about me as a person, but uh, here we go. It's the evening of the 22nd of December 1978. The coal mining town of Shakti in the Soviet Union, just east of the modern Ukrainian border and the Sea of Azov. It was a shockingly flat landscape, characteristic of the region, broken only by a few forest-covered hills that jutted out like naturally formed pyramids in the midst of the town. The name of the town itself means mines in Russian, a name which has been assigned to the town, which had been assigned to the town in 1920 by a dull-minded Soviet bureaucrat. The weather was gloomy and below freezing. A light skiff of snow covered the grounds. Yelena Zagodnova, age nine, was last seen talking to a man at a bus stop. Oh no, age nine. Is she the victim, please? She's talking to a stranger at a bus stop. Oh, she's the victim. Nine years old. Brilliant. 
This man lured the girl to a nearby house, which he had purchased under a false identity three months prior. How do you manage that? How do you buy a house under a false identity? I'm buying a house right now. And it's like, oh my god. The amount of bureaucracy and paperwork and official things. And I live in a post-communist country. So how can communist Russia... Wait, when is this taking place? 1978. How can communist Russia allow someone to buy a house under a false identity? It's insane the amount of bureaucracy involved in buying a house. <laughs> How do they do this? There, the man tried to sexually assault the victim, but was physically unable to. Frustrated, he stabbed the victim three times in the stomach. Only then was the killer able to finish what he started. The guy and dying girl tried to whisper something the killer could not make out. The man then strangled her to death. Okay. Okay. This David is... I, I assume intentionally, he's let us know, that this guy gets caught because other, who, who is the other witness there? The girl is dead. He's the only one that could have known that she said something that he couldn't make out. So at some point, he, he, well, he could have told someone and then never got caught. But I get the feeling he got caught, right? He then took her body to the end of the street and cast it adrift into the freezing river. Yelena's body was found two days later. After an extensive investigation, the Soviet police arrested Alexander Kravchenko. He was a 25-year-old laborer who had been released from prison for a rape and murder that he had committed when he was underage. The man had claimed that he was home with his wife and his wife's friend at the time of Yelena's murder. and This alibi was confirmed by his next-door neighbors. Ah, uh, if it was the wife... You'd be like, that is no alibi. If it was the wife's friend, you'd be like, nah, reasonable alibi. But the neighbor says he's there, he's probably there. Kravchenko was beaten and forced to confess to the murder. Holy shit, Russian police. Not only is that bad, but it's also that just means that you're not that the real guy's out there. Why is this guy in prison? The real this is some communist shit. Because there's someone upstairs being like, or you know, up the ladder, being like, guys, you gotta arrest someone for this by Friday, and they're like, dude. We're not going to be able to get anyone by Friday. Are you kidding? This is a complicated investigation. The guy bought a house and we don't know how he did it, but he did it not in his real name. We're never going to get anyone by Friday. And the guy upstairs is like, you've heard of gulags, right? And they're like, don't worry. We will have found someone by Friday, comrade. Do not worry. No worries. Can we get the guy and the, the rape guy? We get him, yes. <laughs> ah... His wife was threatened with being charged as an accomplice, and his wife's friend was threatened with a charge of perjury. The alibi was abandoned. Standing trial in 1979, Kravchenko retracted his confession and claimed it was tortured out of him. He was nevertheless convicted of murder and given the death penalty. In December 1980, the Supreme Court commuted his death sentence to 15 years in prison, the maximum possible jail sentence at that time. Why is there a maximum jail sentence? I mean, I know this guy didn't stab and murder a nine-year-old, but 15 years in prison is not enough. For that sort of crime is it i don't think anyone would say that's enough time i'm 34 and i if i'm stabbed and murdered and sexually assaulted a nine-year-old i'd be out of prison before i was 50. what the f <laughs> i should be in prison until i die if you're slightly confused at only 15 years imprisonment for the brutal murder of a nine-year-old girl and sexual assault here is the explanation under certain political regimes crimes over a certain threshold of severity including highly dubious charges of treason and subversion almost always bring with it a death sentence not jail time it is why the united states or united kingdom can have significantly higher rates of imprisonment per capita than certain oppressive regimes in the world today where convicted people are routinely killed for a lot less than the murder of a child yeah but it's also like no one's comparing the u if you're comparing the U.S. and being like, the U.S. has a higher rate of people in prison than North Korea. Come on, U.S., get it together. It's like, yeah, North Korea's just killing people. No one makes that argument. You compare them to, like, Norway or some shit, where it's like, yeah, recidivism basically doesn't exist. Prisons are humane, and it just seems like that's a better way of doing things. Except, I mean, I also get a bit upset. Was it that, uh, was the guy who shot all those people on the islands? Was that Norway or Sweden or something? It was in the north. And he's gonna get out of prison someday and i killed like a hundred something people it's not okay he should be in prison forever but then again should he because their justice system clearly their prison system clearly has better outcomes but in kravchenko's case the evidence was not deemed reliable enough to warrant the immediate carrying out of the death sentence which the slaying of the child otherwise would have certainly have brought his guilt had not been conclusively proven after so much police coercion the authorities themselves were simply not sure he'd done it and they hesitated yo if you're not sure that he's done it, that's called reasonable doubt. And that means he doesn't go to prison at all. That means he walks free. Because the whole point of reasonable doubt is that it's better to have someone guilty free than an innocent person in prison. Um, so, again, what is going on today? 
Yelena's outraged family demanded a retrial, and Kravchenko was again tried and convicted of a murder. This time, the sentence was not commuted, and he was shot on July the 5th, 1983. Oh, you know that's a mistake, right? There was a case recently, wasn't there, where a guy was like, he appealed. He was like, I'm appealing my sentence, I don't think I'm guilty, and they gave him more time. <laughs> Being like, well, appeals can go both ways, can't they, mate? And you made a mistake. First of trickle, then a flood. A few dozen kilometers southwest of Shakti is the city of Rostov-on-Don, a major trading hub between the Sea of Azov and the Russian interior via the Don River. It is in some ways a gateway to the Caucasus Mountains to the south and the Volga River network to the east, centered on, east, centered on Stalingrad. On December 3, 1981, Larissa Thukachenko, aged 17, was lured by a middle-aged man with promises of vodka to a forested area along the banks of the Don. There, the man attempted to sexually assault the girl but remained impotent, which enraged him. The assailant muffled the girl's screams by filling her mouth with mud. He beat her, strangled her to death, and mutilated the body with his teeth and a nearby tree branch. Oh, what are you up to? Why are you doing that? Why, why are you with your teeth? What the f***? The killer removed one of the victim's nipples from the scene. Ah, oh, David, why? Why are they? I mean, I'm not asking David why they did this, but it's like, and I know David warns me, but why are we removing nipples? The f Nine months passed on June the 12th, 1980. The police were probably like, yeah, we got the guy. They did it. We we shot him. We shot him to death. We already got him. This is uh, this perfect logic. <laughs> On the 12th of June 1982, Lubov Biryuk, aged 13, was walking home from the shops. A middle-aged man fell into step with her, and they began chatting. Minutes later, the man hit her over the head with the blunt hand of a knife, dragged her into the bushes, and inflicted 22 stab wounds. Post-mortem, the killer sexually interfered with the body. I don't even want to read the next sentence, the next four words. I always read just a few words ahead, because, you know, it's better cold reading that way. Uh, he removed her eyes. Um, let's just take comfort in the fact she was dead first. That at least there's that. Said no one ever. What the what the hell? Two months later, on August the seventh, nineteen eighty-two, Louis above Volboyava, aged fourteen, was found two hundred seventy-five kilometers or one hundred seventy miles south of Rostov in a sorghum field near the airport at Krasnodar. She had been abducted, stabbed, and mutilated twelve days earlier. Her eyes were missing. Dude, why are you collecting eyes? I mean, I know the answer. I know the answer. It's always because, oh yeah, because he's not right in the head because he's a psycho. <laughs> it's, it's obvious. That's why. That's why he's removing eyes. But it's still like, why are you removing the eyes? Come on. On August the 13th, 1982, six days later, Oleg Pozzi Hadea, the nine-year-old boy, was abducted in Adagea, or uh, 320 kilometers or 200 miles south of Rostov. While he was later determined to be one of the Ripper's victims, his body was never found. Only three days later, police, what are you up to? There's a, there's a, serial killers, we've covered them many times. They always go out, they kill a few people. There's usually months, or at least weeks in between. It's not days. Why, why aren't you doing something? At least put a warning out being like, yo, yo, yo. If you're a teenager and a weird man comes up to you and starts talking to you on the street, don't talk back. Just be like, ignore them and walk away. In fact, that's good advice anytime. If I'm walking down the street and someone starts talking to me, I'm very dismissive. If it's like, <laughs> that makes me sound like a knob. If it's someone who's like, hey, fact boy, I'll be like, hey. But if it's just a random person who just ends up talking to you about nothing, or like, I'm just like assuming at some point you're going to ask me for some money, or I don't know, you're drunk or something. But it's like, is that not unreasonable? I feel like I'm now being super unreasonable. But why why don't talk to strangers it's good advice as an adult as well isn't it <laughs> unless you're like out looking to meet people or something <laughs> i felt like such a dick the other day i was in the pub with my friends and uh we're just having a you know we're just having a few drinks having a bit of a chat and some guy comes over and he's just like hey could i sit with you guys and we're just like uh i don't even know what to say in that situation Get the out of here! he was a bit drunk but I'm like, we're clearly just two mates having a beer. Why are you coming over and wanting to sit with us? <laughs> and we're like, and my friend says nothing. And eventually I have to be the dick being like, ah, look, mate, we're just having a, you know, quiet drink chat as two friends. 
And he's just so sad. And then he leaves. And then he sends us over two shots of Sambuca. And I'm like, I haven't drank Sambuca since I was 17. And who are you? <laughs> this is getting weird. And then he comes over again and I have to tell him to leave. <laughs> I know I'm not a dick in that situation. But I feel like a dick. Only three days later, Olga Caprina, a 16-year-old runaway, was abducted from Semikarakorsk, 100 kilometers or 62 miles from Rostov. Her body was found two months later in Kozyachki Lahari, in the middle of Ukraine, just north of the Crimea, a whopping 660 kilometers or 412 miles from the site of her abduction, mutilated, despoiled, missing the eyes. Uh, missing the eyes. I just don't like it. I don't like it at all. On September the 8th, 1982, Irina Karabelnikova, uh, an 18-year-old homeless woman, was lured away from the train station in Shakti by a man promising money and vodka to a local house. Her body was found by the river 12 days later. The same gruesome MO was practiced, yet yeah, especially if that strange man he's talking to you is luring you somewhere with vodka, even if it's Russia. Just say no. On September the 15th, 1982, Sergei Kuzmin, a 15-year-old boy, was abducted shortly... Guys, this is like literally a week later. It's days between these things. What are you up to, police? Was abducted shortly after running away from a local boarding school. His skeleton was found in the woods near Shakta four months later, having decomposed and having been consumed by local wildlife. Although no tissue remained on the corpse, knife marks on the pelvic area indicated the boy... Oh, well, let's just say he didn't take his eyes this time, shall we, David? <laughs> yeah, he, he was castrated. Two months passed, December the 11th, 1982. Olga Stalmachenok, age 10, was... Right, he's expanding outside of T. Oh, well, the girl was nine, the original girl, wasn't he? Ay, ay, ay. Uh, she was riding on the bus home from piano lessons in Novo Shakti, also a mining town founded in 1939, a few miles from the original. She was last seen leaving the bus, being led by the hand by a middle-aged man. The killer took Olga to the edge of the city, stabbed her 55 times, and removed her uterus, bowels, and eyes. I wouldn't even know where to find a uterus. I know it's a woman part, but I'd be like, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to find that. Why am I considering this? I just feel horrible. I feel like a bad person. I feel dirty thinking about this. It's also scary, like the kid's age 10, and it's like now, like I take my kid out, he's nearly two, and we'll go to the park and we'll be wandering around. And she'll just be waving at everyone. If someone said, come over here, she would absolutely go over to them and just be like, hey, <laughs> how you doing, creepy man? And it's like, I don't like that. And I've got to work a fear of strangers into her, which feels like a sad thing to have to do. Because most people are just friendly old women and old men just like, hey, hey, hello. Because she'll just smile at them and they'll smile back and wave and it's so sweet. But unfortunately, there's weirdos. Thereafter, the ripper went quiet and the killing stopped. All this time, Alexander Kruchenko was locked in prison for the murder of Yelena, the first victim in 1978. The real killer remained at large. After a three hiatus, the killer struck again. Then nine months passed before the third murder in 1982. Thereafter, the killings became a spree, with five people being killed in August and September alone. The Ripper's ninth victim was taken in December of that same year. Although the Ripper's MO of stabbing, strangling, and mutilation remained fairly consistent and identifiable, and the Ripper made little effort to conceal the bodies when he left the scene of a crime, the Soviet authorities were slow to draw a link between those murders. This was primarily because of so many of them being committed hundreds of miles apart, and in one case the body was dumped in a distant part of the Soviet Union. I know it was back in the day, and I know the police weren't talking to each other, and I know Soviet bureaucracy was insane, but shouldn't someone should have been like, yo, yo, yo. Has anyone else found a body missing the eyes? I mean, I found a body missing the eyes. I feel like that should be a, a, a news thing. That should be on the internal police memo board. Or whatever they have in 1970s Soviet Union. There should have been something about removing the eyes to link these things together. In short, despite the sudden, rapid, and brazen nature of his attacks, the Ripper was careful to travel wide distances to keep the authorities off his tracks. Nevertheless, by the end of 1982, the police had linked the MO of four of the nine murders, those committed closest to Rostov and Shakti, to the same killer. And the manhunt began. Wait, so the guy's still in prison? I thought they shot him in the end. Or maybe he was still in prison and he was going to be shot later? How on earth are you doing this? He's clearly innocent, because he had witnesses. He had, um not witnesses, accomplices, and there's also all these other murders which are super similar. It was not him. 
The Investigation In January 1983, the Kremlin dispatched Major Mikhail Fetisov and a team of 11 forensic experts to Rostov in order to investigate the murders. When 10-year-old Olga's body was finally found in April, the MO was quickly matched and the number of known victims became five. Meanwhile, the Soviets suppressed the news that there was a serial killer on the loose. The government did not wish to cause public discontent or attract negative international press. <laughs> Oh, it's not your fault that there's a serial killer, although it is your fault that you didn't catch him sooner. As a result, millions of parents and young adults were left entirely unaware of the threat and were not given the opportunity to take special precautions. This is so stupid. Someone could have just said, like I said, there's a man going around kidnapping teenagers and slightly older and slightly younger around that age. Don't talk to strangers. If he offers you vodka, maybe take his eyes, something like that. That seems fair. Suppression of news like this is quite typical in communist regimes, from the suppression of the news of the Chernobyl meltdown to the mass outbreak of certain contagious diseases. Communism was a bit of a bag of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was. Look, I mean, especially like Soviet communism. And that wasn't just communism. The whole thing is like authoritarian regime. All of that was really bad. There's like people, I, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I don't want to sound like a communist. I'm not a communist. I'm a capitalist. But obviously, there's parts of communism that are good. It's great. It's a it's a scale. It's a gray scale. Like I very much believe that healthcare should be free. <laughs> I very much believe education should be free. University education should be, should be free. All of this stuff, schooling, should be free. Um, that's not communism. It's just sensible. <laughs> Simon, just leave the politics out of it. <laughs> like getting into politics is just a way to make a bunch of people not like you. It's like I understand. Like well, it was. It's the Oprah argument, right? It's like, Oprah, why don't you run for president? She's like, because I like everyone liking me, rather than half the country just hating me because of my politics. And I'm like, straight up. <laughs> it's like, absolutely. Yeah, don't do it. Like, I don't let my political opinions be known. I let my polit I don't really have political opinions. I just have ideas. I'm like, I like that. I don't like that. There's no real one party or one thing that really sits right with me. There's things from everything that I like, and there's things from everything that I don't like probably lean more one way than the other but i'm also like not particularly keen on talking about that or sh sharing it even if it probably is the more popular opinion online just because what's the point it just makes people not like you like this tangent <laughs> let's get back to the video festi festisov's team came up with a number of theories for the murders one of the most ridiculous ones was that it was a gang of organ thieves killing people and removing body parts for sale on the black market the sloppiness and haphazard nature of the dissections and eviscerations soon ruled out that theory another was that the murders were being committed by as blood rituals by a gang of satan worshippers but there was never any iconography like a pentagram, candle, or amulet left at the scene, and the ferocity of the attack seems to roll out a slow, calculated ritual. Guys, it's not that complicated, it's just a psycho. Foremost among the theories was that a mentally ill child abuser was acting alone. That seems pretty- sorry, yeah, vi uh, audio listeners, I am nodding vigorously right now because that seems absolutely bang on. And because this was Russia, they lumped in homosexuality. Oh, of course they did. I feel like in Russia, I mean, is homosexuality still not allowed? I mean, not allowed. <laughs> like, you could get rid of it. <laughs> it's like, if it, it's not allowed. It's not allowed. It's like, yeah, but I mean, the, the Russia be like, yeah, I'm homosexual though, aren't I? You can't change that. <laughs> it's just my nature. And they'll be like, but I said it wasn't allowed. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, I, yes, I, surely it's not today, but then you also hear about them suppressing, like, LGBT groups and stuff. I mean, obviously they're not going to allow gay marriage and stuff, but, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's still ridiculous. They should get together, Russia. Which was also considered a sexual offence. I mean, this was also the 1970s, to be honest. It was probably a sexual offence in the UK at that point, which is shocking. Uh, the small team spent weeks and weeks trawling through thousands of potential suspects at psychiatric hospitals and the sex offenders registry, checking alibis. But this was no way for such a small team to conduct an investigation. By casting such a wide net, it would take years to comb through a list of so many individuals. Luckily, the Ripper had gone inactive. This gave the Soviets months and months to refine their dragnet and find the culprits. Half a year, in fact. But they failed. 
In June 1983, the Ripper struck again. Laura Sarkeesian, 15 years old, was found lying by the railroad, railroad in Shakti. Her body bro- bore the same hallmarks of mutilation as the other known victims. Then, Irina Dunnenkova, a mentally disabled girl aged 13, was found in the middle of a park in Rostov on August the 8th. Is it real? So it wasn't enough. It was like, what should we, you know, um... You think of already like the worst when I always go to like murderous pedophiles whenever I think of like the worst criminal possible, you know, outside of like genocides and stuff is, uh, you know, just individual people, murderous pedophile. So not only is this guy a murderous pedophile, but he's also a murderous pedophile preying on disabled children, disabled children. Yeah, yeah, that's worse. A uh, second body was found in the park a day later. Igor Gudkov, a boy aged only seven years old. Ludmilla Kutsuba, 24-year-old homeless mother of two, was also killed during this time, but her body was not discovered until March the 12th, 1984, lying in a forest near a bus station in Shakti. Also during the summer of 1983, an unidentified sex worker in her 20s was taken from Novo Shakti bus station, and her body was found on October the 8th, 1983. Today we know the total number of victims by this point had risen to 14 people, and none of this, none of this would have been quite so bad if there'd just been like, yeah, there's a there's a sex murdering pedophile disabled children on the loose. Keep an eye out. It wouldn't have got this bad. It just wouldn't. People would be like locking their doors. They'd be like care, you know, hiding their children. It just wouldn't be this bad. Finally, by September 1983, the Soviets were forced to publicly admit that they had a serial killer on the loose in the Rostov Azov Caucasus area of the USSR. Yeah, it only took 14 people over a remarkably short period of time. Soviets, come on. Thousands of miles populated by millions of people. Due to the publicity, tips finally started rolling in. But also due to the publicity, and in order to maintain an illusion of control over the situation, the Soviets kicked the investigation into reckless overdrive. Hundreds of people were detained and brutally interrogated. The Soviets extracted multiple confessions to the murders frequently from mentally disabled young men. Multiple people committed suicide after being publicly accused by the authorities of being the murderer or of being a homosexual, a child abuser, or rapist. The only good thing to come out of this purge was that hundreds of unrelated cold cases involving murder and sexual assaults were solved, though whether all the confessions extracted and convictions secured were all that reliable remains a matter of the utmost cynical speculation. I mean, of course they weren't. Of course they weren't. So many were forced. If you've got multiple confessions to the same crime, which clearly they have here for the main crime they're looking for, I bet there were multiple confessions to the other crimes as well. They're just tying them together and sending innocent people off to prison who uh, they just bully into confession because it absolutely happens, which is crazy. I think I saw a YouTube video about it, how like people are forced to confess, how like they eventually just wear you down into confessing something that you didn't do, and it's crazy. I'm like, and there's also just, there's that, that other famous, famous YouTube video where it's like, the police are not your friends. Get a lawyer. Get a lawyer. Those, the number of TV shows I watch nowadays where it's like someone's arrested and they just start talking. I'm always like, where's your lawyer? Where? Lawyer! 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 My wife's like, Simon, it's just TV. And I'm always like, where's the lawyer? <laughs> oh my god. Where is the lawyer? If you get arrested and the police start talking to you, where is my lawyer? In short, a lot of innocent people were hurt and lives were ruined during this particular phase of the investigation. Meanwhile, the actual killer continued to wreak havoc in the Rostov Azov Caucasus area. The Ripper's 15th victim, 22 year old Valentina Chuchulina, was murdered on September the 19th and found in a forest near a railway station in Krasnodar province on. November 27, 1983. Back in Shadki, a 19-year-old sex worker, Vera Shevkun, was murdered on the 27th of October, and while her body was mutilated in the same way, her eyes were curiously left intact, suggesting that the killer had been interrupted. On the 27th of December, a 14-year-old boy, Sergei Markov, was lured off a train as it passed through the countryside and was stabbed 70 times, disemboweled, and castrated. That year, the death toll ended with 17 victims. Meanwhile, Soviet police, absorbed in hundreds of violent interrogations and forced confessions, were nowhere near to finding the perpetrator of these heinous acts. The new year did not bring any relief. In January and February, the bodies of two more women aged 17 and 44 were found in Rostov Park. 44 seems like well outside of his bracket. In March, Dmitry Purtashnikov, a 10-year-old boy who loved collecting stamps, was lured to his death by a man pretending to be a fellow collector. On the 25th of May, in Shakti, 29-year-old Tatyana Petrosian was murdered in the forest. Her 10-year-old daughter, Svetlana, witnessed the murder, and the Ripper pursued her. 
killed her with a hammer and decapitated her. I don't know, man. Between June and August 1984, six more victims were murdered in the Rostov area, bringing the Ripper's death toll to 28 people. While the Ripper was on a business trip in Uzbekistan in August, he murdered two war women before flying home and killing yet another boy in Rostov area days later. This guy just must feel like he's invulnerable. And honestly, it kind of seems like he is. He's just killing people right and left on trips when he's out of the country, wherever he is, in the same place, over and over again. Same MO. And he's not getting caught. He must be like, this is a joke. No one's going to catch me. This is crazy. Um, it's, it's wild. Absolutely wild. A week later, on September the 6th, Ripper abducted 24-year-old librarian Irina Luchinskaya while she was headed to the sauna in Rostov and killed her in a nearby park. This brings the total to 32 victims. This is making him get up there with, like, the... the the most prolific serial killers of all time. 32 is crazy. Meanwhile, the Soviets were becoming desperate to stop the killer and extended their totalitarian surveillance to anything even remotely suspicious. In Rostov on September 13, 1984, two undercover policemen observed a so socially awkward middle-aged man trying to chat up women at a local bus station. The women he approached that day universally thought that he was creepy and moved away from him. The sight, of, the sight of a creepy man undergoing some sort of midlife crisis and ineptly hitting on every young woman he saw was unpleasant and pervy, but not in itself a crime. Also, this guy seems to be more capable than that. Like, he manages to get people to go places. And this the, the super creepy guy, you'll be like, uh, no. It's probably just he's, a, he's not, like, in appearance super creepy. Because he's getting people to do what he wants initially. So, yeah, I don't think this is your guy. Although, then why do we bring this up? But the policemen continued to observe the man. They noticed that he was periodically rubbing himself through his pants. <laughs> that is a little bit... That is a little bit more than creepy, isn't it? The police promptly arrested him on suspicion of being the Rostov Ripper. The man was 5 at 11, had empty, soulless blue eyes that seemed to stare past you. The bone structure of his face was very pronounced, almost skeletal. He had permanently arched and furrowed eyebrows that gave him a sinister appearance, especially when he broke into an unsettling, goblin-like smile. I mean, just because the guy looks weird doesn't mean he's a, a serial killer. It's like, just because he looks like a serial killer. we got to stop, you know... <laughs> Just because he's going for that serial killer aesthetic doesn't mean he's necessarily a serial killer. When the police searched the man, they found several lengths of rope, a knife, and an 18-inch blade. Okay, now it's time to uh, pay a little bit more attention and a jar of lubricants with traces of semen inside it. Oh, dude. What the f***? The man also fit several witness descriptions of the Rostov Ripper. Okay, okay. Oh my god, it's him. <laughs> Never mind. This guy does seem to be a bit of a murderer. Uh, most notably, the man who posed as a stamp collector in order to abduct and murder 10-year-old Dimitri back in March. A sample of the man's blood was taken for comparison to semen samples found on several of the victims. And while the man was in custody, the police ran a background check to see exactly what sort of person they were dealing with here. Ah, let me interrupt things just there for a moment to tell you about Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Curiosity Stream, and I love this talking points, Netflix for nerds, Hulu for history buffs, Disney Plus for the scientists in us. Uh, Curiosity Stream is also extremely affordable at under $20 a year. And I don't know, like, I look at my other subscription things and I'm like, $20, it's, they're off to like around $20 a month, maybe just shy of that a month. And that's the whole year for Curiosity Stream. $1.67 per month is what that works out to be. It's extremely reasonable. I would say cheap, but cheap kind of has bad connotations. What you get with Curiosity Stream for your money is extremely good. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff on there. Yeah, so I've watched a bunch of stuff on Curiosity Stream. I just have it. You can watch it on whatever device you want. I just have it up on my big TV at home. You just click on there. I, my TV's a Samsung, I think. You just click and it's like, oh, okay, cool. Just like Netflix. It's super easy to use. Uh, what would I recommend? Oh, this one I kind of felt is sort of true crimey and sort of related about secret societies. Secret societies play a far larger role in our everyday lives than we are aware of. It's a three-part documentary that accompanies Dr. Marion Fossil on his search for clues surrounding history's most famous secret societies and conspiracy theories, and sort of looks into them, you know, not with that all like, oh my god, it's definitely real. It's, uh, yeah, it's fun. I think if you enjoy this channel, this, this YouTube show, you'll really enjoy that, and a ton of other stuff on CuriosityStream. It's the entertainment brand for people who want to know more. 
Contacts spanned science, nature, history, technology, music, sports, more. And they had new shows every week. So go to curiositystream.com forward slash criminalist for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for you guys, use the promo code criminalist and you'll save 25%, which comes out at only $14.99 a year. So click, wait, I thought it was $20 a year. So I thought $20 was including the promo code. No, it's $15 using the promo code for a year. It's a great deal. Curiositystream.com slash criminalist works out at $1.25 a month. Uh, it's so affordable. It's extremely affordable. They even say it here. Stress how affordable Curiosity Stream is. I don't know how they make it. I don't know how they make it so affordable. Fourteen ninety nine a year. Curiositystream.com slash criminalist. And now back to the show. Meet Andre Chikatilo. Andre Chikatilo was born on or October the 16th, 1936, in the tiny Ukrainian farming village of Yablochna, in the aftermath of the Holodomor. This was a Stalinist engineered genocide of 4 to 5 million Ukrainians. Some estimates go as high as 10 million. Yeah, the Holodomor, I feel like, is a. I mean, I feel most people know what this is, but it doesn't feel as covered as some other genocides in history. And let's not kid ourselves. It was organized this is a genocide officially the holodomor ended in 1933 with the end of the last mass famines though for years more localized famines persisted and the wider ukrainian population suffered malnutrition and starvation in the extreme until several years after the second world war we're talking ethiopian levels of deprivation in what was supposed to be the breadbasket of the world this was due to stalin's forced collectivizations of farms where individually owned peasant property was forcibly amalgamated into state farms as a result of collectivization productivity cratered and what food was produced was frequently shipped off to other parts of the ussr leaving ukrainians with nothing speaking to churchill in 1942 stalin reveled in the fact that his forced collectivization had killed off millions of kulaks which in this context referred to any soviet peasant who was reluctant to give up their property rights to the state that doesn't seem like a very clever thing to brag about although at this point in history churchill's like yeah yeah, yeah. but we're both against hitler right fuck <laughs> that guy and stalin's like did you not hear what they said about the kulaks <laughs> and be like, oh no and churchill's like i'm gonna pretend i didn't hear that because we need you oh my god stalin you monster of course, not all Ukrainians were kulaks, they, uh, but they were starved to death anyway, and the genocide was also cynically used to defang a growing Ukrainian nationalist movement seeking greater autonomy within the USSR. It was in this hellscape that Andrei Chikatilo was born. For Chikatilo's parents, collectivization amounted to nothing more than slavery. They were not paid, they worked as laborers in the fields of a state farm during the day, and in their spare time they were permitted to grow food for themselves in a small patch of dirt in the backyard of their hut. The Chikatilo family subsisted on root vegetables, not even being able to grow grain to bake bread. Not that they had the equipment to do this anyway, and they frequently had to resort to boiling and eating grass. Theft of food from a state farm was punishable by 10 years imprisonment or by death. It goes without saying that any meat in their regular diet was out of the question and would have been the utmost luxury. It is rumored that three years earlier, during the Holodomor itself, Andre Chikatilo's older brother Stepan, who had been kidnapped, and cannibalized. Indeed, cannibalism was widespread throughout the Holodomor, with 3,000 people being caught and charged with the crime, and countless more cases going undiscovered and unpunished. Yeah, so uh, that, that that's a horrible, horrible time to be alive. And also, like I don't know, you think of North Korea today, and it's like, I mean, we don't know what's going on in North Korea, but there's probably stuff like this, right? It's not going well. It's not going well. There's definite parallels. When Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union a few months before Chikatilo's fifth birthday, his father was drafted into the Red Army. A few months later, the Germans had occupied the Ukraine. While many Ukrainians had initially greeted the Germans as liberators, they soon realized that the Nazi occupiers were even worse than, it's, than Stalin had been, which is truly, truly saying something when Stalin has essentially just starved your country to genocide. This was because of Hitler's policy of Lebensraum, which mandated that all Slavic peoples west of the Ural Mountains either be enslaved or killed in order for the vast farmland of the USSR to be settled by Germans. Within a century, with the massive increase of German living space, Hitler hoped to quadruple the size of the German population from 80 million to 320 million. <laughs> Guess what didn't go well? That. 
This necessitated the treatment of Ukrainians as disposable and subhuman, starving them out where possible and generally heaping abuse upon them. In 1942, Chikatilo's mother was raped by a German soldier in her home. Given that Chikatilo shared a bed with his mother in their small hut, it is believed the six-year-old boy witnessed the assault. In 1943, Chikatilo's mother gave birth to a baby girl, Tatiana. It goes without saying that Chikatilo's father had been away at war since 1941. God damn. I'm so glad I live in the future. Like, the past was the worst. Like, being alive during these times, anywhere. Like, being alive at this time in the world, like, in Europe, anywhere, is not brilliant. And then being here, and then being in these people's situation. Man. It's, I'm so glad that I just live in the future. And it's like, I don't know, I try to be grateful for that. Because, oh my god, it was so much worse before. And I just, like, lived this, like, really nice life. Everything's fine. I mean, in comparison, obviously, I have my own little worries and things that don't go perfectly. But it's like, oh my god, compared to like 99.9% .9 of other <laughs> in history, it's like now is so good. It's so good. In this horrible episode today, try and make yourself feel better with that. You're not in this position. Everything's all right. I promise. I mean, comparatively. Here comes the passage you might have expected. Chikatilo's mother was extremely abusive to both of her children. Physically abusive, yes, but in this case, what seems to have done the most damage was when she was abusive verbally. As mentioned, Chikatilo shared a bed with his mother, but he had a problem with bedwetting, for which he was beaten and humiliated night after night. Yeah, that sounds like brilliant parroting. How do you get your child to stop wetting the bed? Beat them until they stop doing it. Said no one ever that this is, this is insanity. Occasionally he was made to sleep on the floor. When his father returned from the war years later, he was in contrast a very kind person, yet this did not seem to provide a sufficient antidote to Chikatilo's gradually contorting psyche. Okay, so I'm guessing that old Chikatilo here is our, is our incredibly prolific serial killer who murders children and sexually assaults them. And look, surprise, surprise, abusive parents. Shocking news. Don't ruin your kids. When Chikatilo began school at the age of eight, he was relentlessly bullied. This was not aided by the fact that his mother's treatment had left him painfully shy, and severe malnutrition had left his growth extremely stunted, his body painfully thin, and his stomach distended. Uh, due to malnutrition, Chikatilo would frequently faint at school, for which he was also bullied. With all of that said, Chikatilo proved an intelligent and talented student, while by no means a genius, he did reasonably well at his academic work. He threw himself into it as a distraction and a shield from the rest of his miserable life. He was the only student in his entire collective farm to graduate from high school. When Chikatilo reached his teenage years and began to think he knew how to fix all of the world's problems, as teenagers often do, he became very passionate about politics and became a devout communist. He was appointed to <laughs> This is the super this is the super like messed up thing about this. It's like, yo, didn't communism starve you and your whole family and your whole country? to the point of death i mean your country men many millions of them died and you to the point of not being very tall and having a distended stomach and all of this weird stuff and you're like you know what works communism it's like you literally saw that it doesn't what's wrong with you he was appointed to several young communist positions in school devoured the marxist stalinist reading list and enjoyed organizing street demonstrations because this was the ussr these street demonstrations were not so much protests as they were loud and animated agreements with whatever state propaganda told him and whatever the kremlin's policies were at the time also when chikatilo reached his teenage years he manifested several pathologies towards women he was cringingly shy and barely capable of asking a girl the time much less asking her on a date. The mental scars inflicted by his mother had left Chikatilo terrified of them and at the same time filled with hate. When Chikatilo was 17, he worked on a newspaper, a uh, student newspaper, with a girl named Lilia Barasheva. Although infatuated with her, he never approached her romantically. Instead, in a shocking foreshadowing of his later crimes, he took out his frustrations on an 11 year old friend of his sister and sexually assaulted her. As he pinned the poor girl to the ground, he immediately achieved sexual gratification, indicating that his sexual sadism had already taken root. In any other circumstances, Chikatilo had chronic impotence and could not achieve arousal without the presence of violence. That is so messed up. It's like, yeah, yeah, don't abuse your kids. The hellscape of Stalinist Ukraine and the multiple torments of his upbringing had created a monster. Yet, given what he would turn out to do, I'm not sure that accounts for even a tenth 
of the explanation. Certainly, childhood trauma is a major predicator of later criminal activity, but not all victims of child abuse become criminals. Certainly, the history of 20th century Ukraine is steeped in misery and bloodstained darker than almost any other region in modern history. But most survivors of that period did not become killers. Chikatilo was later diagnosed with extreme psychopathy, possibly genetically inherited, and borderline personality disorder, which both were exacerbated by the brain damage that he suffered while he was forming in his mother's womb and compounded by the multiple toxic elements of his upbringing. It was likely that he was born a high-risk, unstable individual, and what nature started, nurture finished. Yeah, I mean, I don't want, I'm always like, you know, don't abuse your kids and stuff, but it's like, yeah, if someone's a super kind person, they're probably going to be fine anyway. But statistically, I mean, it's just increasing that chance, the chances of that person becoming a horrible person. So uh, break that cycle. <laughs> break that cycle. An attempt at a normal life. In 1954, Chikatilo tried and failed to win a scholarship to Moscow State University. He moved to Kursk, a major city on the Russian-Ukrainian border, and briefly worked as a laborer before training to become a signals technician. While in Kursk at the age of 19, he attempted a romantic relationship with a woman, which lasted a year and a half. The relationship fell apart because Chikatilo was not able to maintain an erection, and his partner finally gave up on the lack of physical intimacy. From Kursk, Chikatilo moved to the Urals, where he worked on a construction project and took further training as an engineer. In 1957, he was drafted into the Red Army and spent two years as a border guard in Central Asia, followed by a stint as a communications technician in a KGB unit in East Berlin. Chikatilo returned to his, his native Yabulkner in 1960, where he entered a brief dalliance with a divorcee. The relationship did not last long because of Chikatilo's physical inca incapability of having sex. Word travels fast in a small town, and it soon became public knowledge that Chikatilo, still in his mid-twenties, was chronically impotent. <laughs> ah, <laughs> embarrassing. Um, not, not like embarrassing enough to then go on a killing spree, though. Is it Chikatilo? Is it? Pfizer, Pfizer make Viagra? Is Pfizer, right? If only Pfizer was around <laughs> making drugs, none of this would have happened. So Pfizer's to blame. <laughs> not really, not really, allegedly. Uh, this ended any hope of the shy young man from entering a relationship with any other woman in the village and resulted in his being mocked for months openly and in public. A physical malady, which today might be fixed with simple medication, there we go, by the attitudes of the time was regarded as a sign of, sign of infantile, stunted, and feeble manhood. Combined with Chikatilo's social awkwardness, this reduced him to the status of a figure of fun. He tried to hang himself, but he was rescued by his mother and his neighbors, at which point Chikatilo resolved to leave Yabluchne behind forever and move to a place where nobody knew him and where he could rebuild his reputation again from an untarnished position. Yeah, this is another thing about the past. Just go somewhere else, go to a new town, no one knows who you are. These days, it's like, Google the new guy. <laughs> Look him up on the Facebook. In 1961, Chikatilo settled in Rostov and began working as a communications engineer. His sister, Tatyana, soon came out to join him. They lived together for six months before Tatyana, then aged 18, met a man, got married, and moved out. Tatyana took pity on her brother and, in 1963, set him up with a woman... Fe Feodosia Odnecheva. However, only 24 Feodosia was somewhat desperate to get married and did not have an abundance of suitors. She overlooked and even appreciated Chikatilo's shyness and lack of assertiveness. They were married within two weeks of meeting. As for Chikatilo's physical malady, the impotence did not seem to bother Feodosia either, whose priority was to set up a stable family unit rather than holding out and hoping for a passionate romance with someone. Although if they're not going to be able to uh, do the deed, how's that family life going to work out? Instead of having sexual intercourse, Chikatilo and his wife engaged in a crude form of insemination, where Chikatilo would masturbate into his hand and then manually inseminate his wife with his fingers. Again, again. Yeah. Where Chikatilo would masturbate into his hand and then manually inseminate his wife with his fingers. Well, there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, Theodosia gave birth to a daughter in 1965 and a son in 1969. As unusual and ineffective as this form of insemination sounds, there is no evidence that Theodosia was ever unfaithful. However, after the birth of her son in 1969, Theodosia began practicing abortions in secret because she feared Chikatilo could not support a larger family. Gradually, what little physical affection they had dried up during the late 1970s in a typical case of serial killer bed death. That old classic, where a sex-based killer is no longer able or willing to feign the slightest interest in conventional sexual activity. 
And no, Theodosia did not know what Chikatilo was up to or had any strong inkling of his sexual sadism or other pathologies. Like many serial killers, Chikatilo kept his darker impulses and his family separate. His family life had to be preserved. At very least, it was a useful mask, and it was the rest of the people in the world that were disposable. Chikatilo, meanwhile, had studied via correspondence a Russian literature degree with a minor in philology at Rostov University, graduating in 1970. The following year, Chikatilo moved to Novi Shadki to take up a position as a schoolteacher. In May 1973, Chikatilo began sexually assaulting his underage students, spying on them in changing rooms and dormitories, and committing furtive but public acts of masturbation. <laughs> Dude, how can you do that? Like, the fact that that's plural is crazy. It'd be like, yo, 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 the teacher was whacking it outside the changing rooms. It'd be like, well... He's fired and probably in prison. Often when he was sat at his desk in front of the class, oh my god, dude. The school ignored student complaints, but after the behavior continued for a further six months, the administrator asked Chikatilo to resign to avoid a scandal. This culture of silence and permissiveness was not unusual to Soviet schools at the time. Because his conduct was never made public, Chikatilo managed to find a job at another school in Novi Shadki. This time, Chikatilo was careful. If he engaged in any more abuse of his students, it's never come to light. It is possible he simply sequestered his darker impulses from the workplace in the same way he'd done from his family. Chikatilo was nevertheless laid off in 1978 due to budget cuts and moved with his family a few dozen kilometers to the town of Shadki to take up another teaching job. It's so wild that he this was like fully going on he was like assaulting his students he was whacking it in the changing rooms and she said no no you can get a job at another school and another one after that yeah no no it's cool what the f soviet union his dark instincts having been suppressed for half a decade came roaring back to the forefront immediately after arriving in shakti chikatilo chikatilo rented a second house unbeknownst to his wife under a forged identity oh, i guess okay so I still find it amazing that you could get a. F I, I guess, of course, you get a fake identity. You could probably go on the internet on the dark web somewhere, and someone's gonna like hook you up with a fake identity for like. I don't know. I imagine that's pretty expensive. But also, how good is a fake identity these days? Because I don't know, like a fake passport, right? But it's not like you go through passports and it's the 1980s, and there's someone looking at the passport and they'd be like, "Yeah, it looks good." It's like that passport scans by a machine, which I assume goes into some international database of like police and where they're like yo 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 terrorist boy <laughs> come over here because it's you got flagged up in some system and if they scan the passport it's like uh this passport number's not in the system then they're gonna be like yo uh what is going on this is a fake passport or even if it's a passport and it's got like a different picture in it like if your face is i guess you could have a passport like stolen from someone who looks like you but it's like that's getting really complicated false identity how does this even work I feel like I should know this because I read. I love spy novels. I'm always reading spy novels. But uh, I guess they're always just, you know, they're like, yeah, he took his false passport. It's fine. It's like, yeah, how do you get that false, false passport? Where does that come from? How is that possible? I'm sure someone in the comments is like, uh, Simon, it's obviously very easy. It's just, I don't know, you use someone who's dead. But it seems like what they don't look like you. How's that work? It's clear from the start that he intended to use this house as a staging area for various acts of child abuse. Nearly three months later, Chikatilo had committed his first murder there, nine-year-old Yelena, with whom this story began. For three years, Chikatilo committed multiple acts of child abuse against his students, but may not have killed any more children. There are three troubling unsolved allegations. <laughs> I feel like, wait, 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 unsolved allegations. Three unsolved allegations. And in this case, do we mean allegations like murder? He might not have killed anyone, but there are unsolved allegations. So three kids went missing around where this dude is. Maybe in his school. Maybe they were his students. So it's like, I don't know, they just went missing. So it's, it could be the murderous pedophile did something with them, or they just went missing. In this case, guys, let's just say it's the murderous pedophile. Because it is, allegedly. He was fired in 1981 after multiple complaints of molestation had stacked up. <laughs> oh my god, what is going on? He gets fired for this? I mean, obviously. Why is he not in prison? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> What's his face? Harvey Weinstein's in prison. I guess that we live in a different time. And that's America. <laughs> Whereas this is like Soviet USSR many decades ago. But I'm like, come on. Come on. We know this is wrong. <laughs> Please. Now unable to find another teaching job, mate. Did you even try? It <laughs> People are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, can I get a reference to your last school? Oh, no, no, no. They fired me because I was a murderous pedophile. Oh, 
Oh. Well, welcome, Mr. Chikatilo. We'll put you in the music department. The Chikatilo took a job as a supply officer for a Rostov factory. This job required Chikatilo to travel to hundred, travel hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles to meet with suppliers. Thus, Chikatilo was able to move across the Soviet Union, killing as he went without arousing suspicion. Within six months of arriving in Rostov, Chikatilo had committed his second murder. At this point, Chikatilo claims that he abandoned any attempt to restrain himself, and the entire sickening cataclysm of dozens of brutal murders began. The Twist Which brings us back to September 1984, when Andrei Chikatilo was finally in custody, having been caught by two undercover policemen, harassing women and rubbing himself through his pants at a train station in Rostov. They found incriminating evidence on his person, a knife, a rope, and sexual lubricants, and sent his blood away for testing. They definitely had, didn't have DNA back then, so could they have, did they have blood type testing? You know, that was another thing they did where they, uh, you know, compare, I mean, obviously it's not definitive, but at least it can rule someone out. They can test the blood type of blood at the scene or wherever against his. A long last after much police incompetence, it's an understatement, suppression of the news of a serial killer followed by a hysterical and unproductive witch hunt, the Soviet authorities had found their man. Unproductive witch hunt, David? What are you talking about? They solved hundreds of crimes. And by solved, I mean they forced people to confess to crimes they probably didn't commit which was brilliant, and then people started killing themselves. Well done, police. Well done. They had Andre Chikatilo in custody, but what to charge him with to keep him there while the police built their case? Fortunately, in 1984, the factory Chikatilo worked at had raised suspicions that he had stolen supplies in order to sell them secondhand for extra money. The police promptly charged him with theft and kept Chikatilo in prison. <laughs> He's like, oh man, of all the things I thought I'd get caught for, murder of dozens of children or theft. Uh, obviously, it's just an excuse to keep him there, which is good. I like that. The blood test came back after being compared to semen samples found on uh, the victims. This being the Soviet Union in 1984, however, there was no capacity for DNA testing, of course. In fact, the process of DNA profiling was only just being developed in laboratories of the United Kingdom and the United States. Wow, I didn't realize it was... I thought this was a 90s thing, not an 80s thing. That's cool. And it would be a further two years before it was first used forensically in a criminal case. Instead, the precursor at the time was to match blood types. Oh, look at my big brain in action. By no means as precise as DNA, it was still a useful method of securing convictions and ruling out suspects. I mean, it's got to be much more useful at ruling out suspects, right? Because if it's like, yeah, yeah, you just happen to have blood type B and so is this blood at the crime scene, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, but millions of people in this country have blood type B. But if it's blood type B and your blood type a or a whatever you know one of the many other blood types uh, anyway different blood type then you'd be like well it can't be me and so it's good for ruling people out at least andre chikatilo had type a blood the semen samples meanwhile had been classified at the police laboratory as type a b thus chikatilo was ruled out as a suspect holy shit, i did not expect that he was convicted of theft given a one-year sentence and released after serving three months <laughs> wait wasn't there a murderous pedophile earlier in this video that uh, I'll tell you a little secret. I actually went home halfway through recording this because it was just really long and I ran out of time <laughs> and it just got to the end of the day. Uh, but I'm pretty sure earlier in today's episode, there was a dude who went to prison for like 15 years for horrible crimes. Um, and this guy gets basically a one year sentence for stealing pens. I mean, maybe they were, but he was also ruled out as this person in their eyes. I get the feeling he's still guilty somehow. Or maybe he's not. That blood type thing's pretty pretty damn convincing but we wouldn't have spent so long on him david wouldn't have written such a long epic about chikatilo if he didn't have something to do with it right uh anyway how did he get a year sentence for stealing pens that seems amazing exonerated as a suspect in the serial murders chikatilo walked the ripper had just been set loose again on the public okay so yeah we know it was him <laughs> spoiler alert although i feel like we knew that right at the beginning with something david wrote right blood red resurgence now known to the police, Chikatilo kept his head down while he regularly followed the news of the manhunt, watching out for breakthroughs in the case. He needed not have worried. Although he was now on file and police records, they dismissed him utterly as a suspect due to the blood type discrepancy. Meanwhile, Chikatilo scored another factory job in Nova Cherkask, 41 kilometers, 25 miles northeast of Rostov. The job afforded him the opportunity to travel again. Chikatilo waited nearly a year after the date of his arrest to make sure he wasn't being observed by the Soviet police. Then, on August 1st, 1985, he struck again. It's weird with the Soviets, right? Because I feel like if he was committing, uh, like, political crimes, the KGB would be involved in whatever, and he'd have, like, 17 bugs, like, in his coat. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we uh you get busted in like a day and then you get taken to some gulag or just out the back and shot whereas this guy's like a murderous pedophile rolling around and it's like no 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 you got the kgv who are like super hunting down with all sorts of crazy spy sh and soviet police who seem absolutely incapable of doing anything crazy Chikatilo had traveled to Moscow to talk with a supplier. There he saw Natalia Poglistova, 18 years old, standing on a railway platform near a Moscow airport. Chikatilo followed her onto the train. Watching her from a distance, he continued to stalk her when the train pulled into her stop. She got off, so did he. Trailing behind her, Chikatilo seized his opportunity and dragged the victim into a small thicket of trees. There he tied her up, assaulted her, stabbed her 38 times while simulating sexual movements every time he struck, and then he strangled her as she lay exsanguinating on the ground. Her mutilated body was discovered two days later. She had died less than two blocks from her house. This is just... I feel a little bit desensitized to it, but in any other casual criminalist, this would be the single brutal murder of the episode. And instead, this is like victim number 700 or whatever. It's crazy. This is so crazy. I hope this guy gets tortured to death. <laughs> yeah. I mean... I also feel like I was about to say that sounds a bit harsh. And then I'm like, does it though? <laughs> does it? And now I'm like going to have one of those. Uh, with this, again, you know, it's become a bit of a meme in the YouTube comments. Like Simon's having an existential crisis over the death penalty again. And it's like, but then with this one, I'm like, nah, nah, I'm good. And if someone was like, Simon, what if you had to carry out the punishment on him? And I'd be like, cool. <laughs> sounds good, actually. I'd do that. I'd have no problem shooting this guy in the face. The news hit the Soviet police like a bucket of cold water. It had been 11 months since the last murder, and there had been no development in the case. If the Ripper had stopped permanently, in a few months the Soviets could have swept the case under the rug and mollified the public with a propaganda campaign. Now there was another murder with the same grisly MO in the nation's capital, no less. Given that the majority of the murders happened in the vicinity of Rostov, the police came to the conclusion that the killer was based there. Thus, investigators looked at passenger records of all people who flew from Rostov to Moscow around August the 1st. But Chikatilo had not flown. He had taken the train from Novochekhovsk to Moscow. The Ripper slipped the net yet again. I mean, come on, police. Just because he commits the crime somewhere. Like, if you were a murderer, right? Don't commit crimes in your own town. If you're like some desperate person with a bloodlust and you're a murderous pedophile, just go to the next town. Okay. Stop giving advice to criminals, Simon. Jesus Christ, what is actually right? It's just so hard not to point out the stupidity. And also the stupidity of the police of being like, wait, I mean, couldn't he just travel somewhere to commit his crimes? That sounds like a great way to throw off the police. And also, police, there are other things other than aircraft, especially in the 1980s. I mean, passenger transport by air was, of course, common there. I guess in the Soviet Union as well. I don't really know, but I'm just thinking like internationally. And uh, But people still travel by train and car. And we're not talking unfathomable distances here. <laughs> At the end of August, Chikatilo returned to Shaki, where it all began. On August the 27th, he lured 18-year-old Irina Guyaeva away from the bus station and murdered her in a small woodland grove. She was found the next day with the same telltale signs that had been the Ripper's work. This guy, we call him like the Ripper, like in a twisted homage to Jack the Ripper, right? But this guy, he seems way worse. Jack the Ripper's like super famous for killing lots of prostitutes. This guy has like... His body count is just insanely higher. Right? Jack the Ripper didn't actually kill that many people. Like, confirmed ones that we know were him. Right? This guy is killing everybody. It's crazy. And also, he seems like a right weirdo. So how... It, it, there's this weird contradiction of him being like this kind of creepy dude he's walking around a bus stop and touching himself through his trousers which i mean we've all got an image of that person in our mind and then there's also the guy who seems to be able to like lure people away to to the bushes and be like yeah just come check out these bushes if it's the weird guy who's touching himself through his clothes at the bus station you're like uh what are you talking about but if he's like some i don't know uh what's that the guy uh like some ted bundy dude you know some like charming serial killer like oh yeah ted bundy look at him he's great we can trust him 100 percent. and then i'll cut your face off um but it doesn't seem like this guy's like that at all oh it's weird still anxious about the police chikatilo had halted uh, then halted all of his activities. He knew that the two murders would have sent them into a frenzy to find him again, so the Ripper bided his time, waiting for things to settle down. The Soviet police were not idle. The massive government pressure bore down upon them. 34 people had been killed. Ah. Oh my god, I gotta look up Jack the Ripper death num number of people. 13 women. So this guy's killed nearly three times as many people as Jack the f Ripper. Mental. 
Uh, the Ripper had been lo- on the loose for years. The public were outraged, so the police kicked things into high gear. A special prosecutor was appointed. The number of people working the case quadrupled, and other rounds of interrogations plagued Russia, but was less coercive than before. The beat up. The beat cops absolutely flattened Rostov with their overwhelming presence. Undercover female police officers posing as prostitutes and teenage schoolchildren hung around Rostov waiting to be approached by the killer, all to no avail, because the killer was no longer based in Rostov. Oh my god, how, what a surprise. So, (laughs) ah, he just left because there were loads of police around, obviously, as you would. I just... I mean, I can't, I, I mean, I'm sure, like, if I sat down and thought about it for 15 minutes, I could probably come up with a better strategy than just put loads of police on the ground. Let's just be more quiet about it. Let's just mo- do more undercover police. Because if you just, like, go out in force with lots of police, that's not really going to help because the person's just going to slip away and be like, oh, I'm done with this place. Russian Mind Hunter. There we go. This is a much better idea. Get one of these like criminal profilers to come in and be like, let's actually try and figure this out rather than just doing overwhelming manpower, which I guess was a theme in the Soviet Union. In November of 1985, Dr. Alexander Bukanovsky, a behavioral psychiatrist, was appointed to the investigation to engage in the first psychological profiling of a serial killer in Soviet slash Russian history. Bukhanovsky compiled a 65-page report that predicted the man was well-educated with a professional career that allowed him to travel, that he probably had a family from whom he kept his activities a secret, and that he was between 45 and 50 years old. Bukhanovsky had also uh, accurately predicted the man would be sexually stunted and capable of socializing with women, that he likely suffered from impotence. Wow, that is like... (laughs) That is is impressive. I, I guess there's a lot of... Yeah, well, hang on. If he's sexually assaulting people and he's not actually, you know raping them uh then i guess we can i mean although rape has many definitions but you know uh using (laughs) simon why are we going to these dark depths but you get what i'm getting at right we don't need to we don't need to have me say these horrible words that he likely suffered from impotence and could only achieve orgasm by engaging in sexual sadism the reason for the killer's sadism would derive from a feeling of inadequacy probably inculcated that is such a hard word to say in childhood by an abusive parent i mean although to be fair i'm not a psychiatrist psychiatrist what was this guy behavioral psychiatrist and i'll be like probably had shitty parents <laughs> it's not a hard one <laughs> someone who's listened to two episodes of the casual criminalist could be like yeah yeah, yeah. bad parents it's always bad parents Given the preponderance of female victims, probably the mother, with catastrophically low self-esteem and feeling unworthy of women's voluntary physical affection, he would not be aroused by it, but only made anxious by it. Instead, he would only respond sexually to physical contact when he had seized that contact for himself against the victim's will. The killer had developed a deeply rooted mental pathology where deep down he did not think he could ever be desirable, and so the only true sexual circumstances for him were those of brutal coercion. Due to the coercive nature of the acts, the killer would prey upon those he thought were vulnerable and weak. As such, the fact that the Ripper occasionally targeted children had nothing to do with a particular attraction to them. Unlike most child abusers, he simply thought they were weak enough to allow him to strike. The same went for preying on adult women who were either prostitutes, poor, homeless, or runaways, or simply alone and of a submissive and easily led disposition. Ah, oh, so you know, so it's like we can add a lesser, but still I feel like nice thing to tack onto there murderous pedophile coward or simply alone and of a submissive and easily led disposition as the killer's confidence grew he began to target adult women more and more and while the ripper had targeted young boys on multiple occasions even teenage boys the demographic of adult men was conspicuously absent because in the killer's mind they did not fit the profile of vulnerability which the killer required while almost certainly bisexual the killer would not enjoy sex of any description with an adult male who theoretically could resist and overpower him ah mega coward most intriguingly and grotesquely the killer's impotence had prompted him to use a knife as a substitute for an erection holy shit. oh we knew this didn't we there was the he was doing the sexual moves with the knife. ay 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 david when you emailed me and said this one is about as dark as it gets i mean god damn what is he later in the script going to commit a genocide because i feel like we're already at the depths each stab would be accompanied by a pelvic thrust, and only when having inflicted enough violence to become aroused would the killer either masturbate or defile the victim's body. The killer appeared to have no qualms about whether this happened pre or post mortem. As for post mortem mutilations and eviscerations, this was the killer reveling 
in what he'd just done. He had sexually seized another human being. Seeing the harm he had already inflicted with a sense of euphoria, he would continue to cut into the victim and wreak further damage in a sick and twisted sort of victory lap. Oh my god, these words are horrible. After the murder and his own orgasm. Oh, as such, oh, I read ahead and I see what he's doing. The f my dude. Uh, he would cut out the genitals, bowels, and stomach and lay them aside to admire as trophies. He would also tear out the victim's tongue and nipples with his teeth. It was likely that the killer either chewed or fully consumed some of these body parts raw. David, where are we going with this, my dude? I'm just like, how could it get worse? How could it get... And then it just does. True story. Given his likely double life with a wife and family, he would disregard any discard anything he took home with him long before he returned home. However, the cutting out of the eyes was a special case since the act implied somehow the killer did have a vague sense of shame for feeling driven to commit these crimes. He did not want his victims to look at him, yet the cutting out of the eyes once his calling card had grown less and less frequent over the years, implying that the killer's sense of shame was diminishing. It goes without saying that Rukhanovsky's work turned out to be fairly accurate. Yeah. I mean, that's so crazy. I would have never thought that about cutting out the eyes, that it was a shame thing, which is why I'm not a behavioral psychiatrist. But I'm like, damn. I would have just been like, he likes eyes. <laughs> it's just like, because he's broken. Because his brain is broken and he needs to be in prison or shot. Fairly, finally, given the lack of effort to conceal the bodies once he had killed them and the nature of the attacks, it was likely that the Ripper did not return to the scene of his crimes to relive the events like some serial killers did. No, he might, like... I feel like the serial killers who return to the scene of the crimes to relive their crimes is because they're not killing that often. Whereas this guy's like, why would I return to my crimes? I'll just do a new crime. Because the police seem absolutely incapable of catching this guy. He's killed nearly 40 people. However, the killer may have indeed favoured particular locations to carry out some of his killings, and his version of reliving his crimes was simply returning to the location to repeat the act again with another victim. Okay, there we go. David and I, same page. This would explain why the killer, capable of operating all over the country, seemed incapable of staying away from the woodlands of Shakti and the parks and bus lanes of Rostov, even if he no longer lived and worked in the area. Here was a possible opportunity to make an arrest. Ah, oh, look! Look, look, look! Yeah, there we go! So let's put some undercover people in the parks. Let's get them on those bus stops. Let's, uh, yeah. That seems like a much better idea than just put uniform police out everywhere. They shouldn't have put the uniform police out in the everywhere in the first place because they should have just made him feel like he was getting away with it and gone undercover immediately rather than put all the uniform police out because then he left town. I don't know. That seems like, I don't know, it seems like a mistake. I often like, I don't know, I read these and I'm like, this seems like such an obvious mistake. And I'm always like, well careful simon because you're obviously doing this in retrospect and you've got perfect information but this does feel like even at the time that that's not the right move like oh my god this is such a tangent but uh yesterday the government here announced that christmas markets i'm recording this in late november christmas markets were cancelled because there's too many covid cases but the pubs will remain open and i'm like government so what you've done is you basically just said yo 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 all of you people who are going to be outside at christmas markets are now just going to go to the pub instead inside and i'm like barely sure it's easier to get covid inside i'm like what are you up to government i have no background in health but i'm pretty sure i can make a better decision than that and it's just like no decision would have been better than that you're actually hurting it you're making it worse i don't understand sorry tangent over that upset me because i also wanted to go to the christmas market because i'm not going to the pub because there's covid everywhere it's crazy the timid ripper After his 34th victim, the stepping up of the police investigation and the overpowering public hysteria around the killings, Chikatilo was intimidated into silence and inactivity. He did not kill again for another year. Then August the 11th, 1986, he targeted 18-year-old secretary Irina Pogoyalova while he was in Batysk. This is just 15 kilometers or 9 miles south of Rostov. With his victim, Chikatilo displayed, Chikatilo displayed an uncharacteristic degree of caution by burying her in the fields of a collective farm. The fact that he had delayed his killings and taken care to conceal this particular crime implies Chikatilo was getting nervous. Almost another year later, Chikatilo lured a 12-year-old boy, Oleg Makarenkov, from a railway station in Revda, a small town in the Ural Mountains, with promises of a meal at his house, which Chikatilo claimed was nearby. Once again, after the murder, Chikatilo took care 
to conceal the body. Two more young boys were killed in 1987. The first, Ivan Bilovetsky, age 12, was murdered in July and concealed in the trees near a railway station in Zaporizhia in the middle of eastern Ukraine. His own father found the body while searching for him. The second, in September 1987, was 16-year-old Yuri Tereshenok, who was murdered and buried near Leningrad. Then the killings ceased again. Most notably, in 1987, Chikatilo refrained from killing anyone in Rostov due to the police focus there instead. He spread out his murders across the USSR. <laughs> you could have predicted that. You could have possibly predicted that. And attempted to delay or prevent the bodies from being found. This was just as well, since unbeknownst to him, in 1987, he had briefly been added to the bottom of the list of, a potential, sus of potential suspects. Ooh, I thought we kind of already wrote him off for not having the right blood type. How is that going to be explained? There must have been a mistake in the lab or something, or he tricked them somehow. Chikatilo tried to observe the same caution in 1988 with only partial success. Again, he killed only three victims that year in April, May, and July before stopping again. The first victim was an unidentified woman in her 20s in Krasny Sulin. He then switched up his MO by bludgeoning her with a slab of concrete rather than strangling her after he had stabbed her. He also refrained from eviscerating the victim. The second was a murder of nine year old boy Alexei Voronko in Ilyovsk far away from Rostov in the Ukraine. But in this murder, Chikatilo could not resist returning to his usual MO. Then, in July, Chikatilo was drawn back to Shakti, where he murdered 15-year-old Yevgeny Moratov, where he also followed his usual MO to the letter. It is quite clear that Chikatilo could not achieve the same euphoria when he deviated from his set pattern, and that he remained drawn to the Rostov region, and Shakti in particular, the site of his first murder. I know, I feel like I'm just a broken record going on about this. But it's like, I've never seen a casual criminalist episode, never done a casual criminal episode, where it's just this guy. It's just absolutely killing people brazenly, blatantly, in the same way, in the same place, over and over again, dozens of victims, and he's just not getting caught. It's unbelievable. Despite Chikatilo's fading discretion, he managed to suppress his urges for another seven months before killing again. By the end of 1988, the Rostov Ripper had claimed the lives of 41 people, most of them young adults or children, in a reign of terror that now spanned over a decade. And now, he was nowhere near the list of suspects being investigated by Soviet police. Manhunt à la Muscovite Noire on February the 28th, 1989, fresh hell broke out anew. Chigatilo lured Tatyana Rizhova, a 16-year-old runaway, to his then 24-year-old daughter's apartment in Shakti. I forgot that this dude has a daughter who is... This is... Ay, ay, ay. Chikatilo's daughter had left her apartment vacant for a while, so Chikatilo thought that it was an ideal place to discreetly commit murder, dismember the body, and throw the remains into the sewers in an effort to conceal his crime. It didn't work, and the victim was found a little over a week later. Chikatilo would kill four more people. <laughs> In 1989, three of whom were murdered in either Rostov or Shakti. Due to Chikatilo's caution, two of the four murders were not discovered at the time. Meanwhile, the mask had begun to slip in Chikatilo's family life. On his way home from a business trip, he looked in on his daughter and his grandson in Shakti. One night, Chikatilo entered his grandson's room and tried to molest him. He was caught. From this point forward, Chikatilo's daughter cut off all contact with him. Not long afterward, Theodosia, Chikatilo's wife, filed for divorce. Yeah, uh-oh. Like, dude... <laughs> You, this it's not gonna work out well for you as the year 1990 dawned the soviet union crumbled all around them uh, the gloom of the russian populace was heightened by the fact that the ser that a serial killer was still on the loose claiming victims by this point however chikatilo had largely abandoned caution and fo caution focused most of his efforts on the rostov shakti area because it was the area of his earliest murders it held a strong erotic power over him meanwhile the police had stepped up their game once again <laughs> to basic competence maybe uh, in the area. While undercover policemen had been a fixture of the railways and bus lines for years now, they had never managed to detain and question a suspicious character who turned out to be the Ripper. Well, no, they did in 1984, but they actually let, but they ended up letting him go. Yeah, because of the blood type thing, which is crazy. This dude just seems incapable of getting caught for crimes. He's like, he kills all these people, and then he molests his own grandson, and the police are still like, no one's reporting that to the police? What's up? <laughs> What are you up to? When I think about all the things I've done in my life, 
without in any way resulting in punishment. But now, in 1990, undercover policemen were equipped with cameras to film passengers on the buses, trains, and at stations. In addition, hidden cameras were also installed in train cars. The idea was that even if they couldn't spot the Ripper in action, if they could film the last moments of a victim being lured away by the Ripper, once the body was identified, they could review the footage and see the man who had taken them. In a world before CCTV cameras were abundant in most urban areas, I have to admit, this was a pretty solid idea. Yeah, it's kind of a dark thing, though, because it's like, as the police, you want to be like, no, no, no. We're going to catch him with people before he takes his next victim. And at this point, they've been like, look, look, look. We have to accept that he's going to take another victim. So let's at least get video of him taking that victim. So when we find their body, we can do something about it. Which is like, yes, you have to do that. But it's also like a crazy thing as the police to be like, yeah, yeah, we're just going to let him kill. Because we need to catch him. That's intense. But it didn't work. Oh. I guess we didn't step it up to basic to basic competence, did we? The problem was, if you assigned a few dozen policemen equipped with cameras the massive transport system of Rostov, you were filming literally tens of thousands of people a day. And people make conversation. Quite innocently, in fact. As hard as it may be to believe, especially after this f***ing script, not all people talk on public transport as serial killers or their future victims. So you'd have to be really, really lucky to capture on film someone who later turned out to be a victim and capture the precise moment when the killer approached them and lured them away. David, I don't know how it is in Australia, but like talking on public transport, I don't know, like I used to live in London. It's just not something you do. I had a friend <laughs> and I was like, I'm also someone who like, I'll be on the London Underground and I'll just be like, you know, sitting there, standing there, just on my phone or whatever. Just like, don't let people in the eye, don't engage with people. I had a friend who was like, he just doesn't sit down on the London Underground. I'm like, mate, why don't you ever sit down? There's loads of seats. Can't we sit? And he's like, oh, I don't like to sit down. And I'm like, why not? And he's like, because you're facing someone on the opposite side and I don't like the idea that I'd accidentally make eye contact with them. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Because <laughs> you don't want to. No one wants to talk to each other on the underground, which is great. It should, that's how it should be. I mean, you'll literally be crammed in there. Obviously, like pre-COVID times, although I don't know how it is in London nowadays, but it's like, you know, rush hour on the underground, you'll be like, your face will basically be inside someone else's armpit and yet there'll be absolute perfect silence. <laughs> From January the 14th to October the 17th, 1990, Chikatilo killed a further six people. Five of the six people were killed in Rostov Shakti area, to which the killer had appeared to have gravitated again and intended to stay. Only one of the victims was killed elsewhere in Chikatilo city of residence, Novacherkask, which wasn't very far away. They were all killed in the same gruesome MO, which, if I have to relive it again, I think I'm going to be sick, have to take another break, and this script will never get done. Am I imagining, or is this episode super long? I haven't looked at the clock on the camera in a while, but I feel like we're really, like, we're really deep on this one. This is a horrible and long episode, and I'm kind of glad that we're skipping over going through this horrific MO again. The Soviet police shifted strategy once again. Ooh, maybe this time it's a shift to basic competence. If the large train stations of Rostov were too crowded to catch them, I have to say that the last thing was quite good. Like, you, the idea of capturing them on film. Yeah, that wasn't, that was competent. It just didn't work. If the large train stations of Rostov were too crowded to catch the Ripper in the act, either the person, either in person or on film, then these large stations should be flooded with 360 uniformed policemen who made their presence obvious. This would drive the killer away from the large crowded stations for fear of being caught. Instead, the killer would force to be start stalking, to start stalking victims at the smaller train stations exclusively. Here, there would be no uniformed police, only undercover policemen who could more easily make out the Ripper amongst the crowd, if not to catch him outright capture him on film with his intended victim now when they first said that i'm like okay so they just put loads of policemen in there i'm like he's just gonna go somewhere else which they sort of did before when they put loads of policemen in the town he just left the town and started killing elsewhere but this time they have a plan this is what they should have done the first time around not that i thought of it but it is a good idea Genuinely, it was pure genius, assuming the Ripper didn't abandon Rostov Shakti area again and start long distance killings in wider Russia. Yeah, but if you're, you're basically making a honeypot for him, right? It's like you make the small stations, and that's where I have to do it. It's clever. I like it. On October the 30th, three days after the new police operation commenced, Chikatilo managed to lure Viktor Tishchenko, age 16, from one of the smaller railway stations in Rostov without being spotted by undercover police. Oh, well. Chikatilo took him to a nearby forest. There, Chikatilo ambushed the teenage boy, but Viktor Tishchenko was no pushover. He fought back. When the police arrived at the scene, they noticed the brush had been thoroughly disturbed, with blood splatter in multiple locations and branches torn to the ground amid a desperate struggle. 
struggle. As the two men grappled, Viktor Tushchenko had managed to bite one of Chikatilo's fingers, breaking the bone and ripping off one of his finger Ooh, fingernails. Unfortunately, Viktor could not put up resistance forever against an armed man, and he was stabbed 40 times and dispatched in a similar way to the other victims. Chikatilo dumped some iodine onto his finger to disinfect the wound, but he did not seek medical treatment for it. A week later, on November 6, 1990, Chikatilo lured a 22-year-old homeless woman, Svetlana Korostik, from yet another small railway station to the woods, where he killed and mutilated her according to his usual M.I. Chikatilo then returned to the railway station, where he was noticed by an undercover policeman as he washed some mud from his hands and face. The policeman also noticed Chikatilo had mud caked onto his clothes. It seemed odd that a man should be tramping about the woods in business attire. The policeman approached Chikatilo and checked his identification papers. As he did so, the policeman noticed a smudge of what could be blood on Chikatilo's cheek and a rather nasty-looking wound on one of his fingers. Yet even in Soviet Russia, one didn't arrest a man for having a boo-boo on his finger and muddy clothes, so the policeman let him go. I'd be writing that guy's name down so hard and be like, yeah, yeah, we'll let you go. And now we're going to follow the hell out of you. Svetlana Korostik's body was found seven days later. The undercover policeman from the nearby train station revealed to the investigative team that a suspicious man with mud, a wound, and possible blood on his cheek had been there around the time of the murder, and that man was identified as Andre Chikatilo. The investigation team remembered the man whom they'd arrested in 1984. At the time, he fit the profile of the killer fairly well, but had been exonerated by blood testing. A background check revealed that Chikatilo's employers in Rostov and Novocherkask had sent him on business trips that accorded with the timing and location of the known murders. This is so busted, but how do we explain the blood? A further background check with two of the three schools that had employed Chikatilo in Shakti and Novo Shakti in the 1970s revealed that the man was an egregious sex pest who was predatory towards his students. If Chikatilo had been reported by the schools and charged for some or all of the molestations of his students, he would be in the sex offenders registry and would have been picked up by the Soviet police as early as 1983. Yeah, which is insane. It's insane that he got away with molesting his students and he just got fired. He molested his own grandson and didn't get reported to the police. If any of this had happened, he, many people's lives would have been saved. Which is crazy. Remember to report criminals. Despite these... I feel like, yeah, 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 grass on, grass on people. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When they're pedophiles, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because they could be murderous pedophiles. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh my god. Despite the inconsistency with the blood testing in 1984, fit, the Chikatilo fit the killer's profile very well indeed. They placed Chikatilo under police surveillance the very next day. What the police witnessed was disturbing, for hours at a time, instead of going to work or home, Chikatilo would hang out at the stations, on trains, or on buses, apparently headed nowhere in particular. He would approach a woman or child and begin chatting to them affably. When the potential victim got creeped out and moved away, Chikatilo would sit there for a moment in silence, move to another part of the train where he hadn't already been observed by the passengers, and try the same thing again with a new intended victim. After six days of recording this repeated behavior, Chikatilo was arrested at a small cafe near his house in Novichokask. Dude, you're getting it. This is, it's game over for you. You're getting taken to a gulag, hopefully, and shot. Blood isn't spunk, oh my. When Trigatillo was arrested for the second time, he denied everything and claimed that he had been through all of this before in 1984. One can almost see him rolling his eyes and acting offended. Like last time, the search of Trigatillo unearthed a knife and some rope. Examination of the wound on Chikatilo's finger revealed that it was caused by a human bite mark, which Chikatilo unwisely denied. Chikatilo was then shipped off to Rostov, where he was locked in a cell with a police informer whose job was to pump Chikatilo for information or a confession. When Chikatilo was interrogated by the police, they too tried to get him to confess. A confession was really the only way they were going to pin the murders on him. They didn't have anything beyond Chikatilo's presence nearby. One of the murders covered in mud, a vague correlation between his movements and the murders over several years, the fact that he obviously was a child abuser, and the fact that surveillance had observed him for several days being creepy in public. I feel like it, there's enough in there to have him, you know. They could work it, so, oh yeah, 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 you get like 25-year sentences that will all serve concurrently. Uh, consecutively. Consecutively, yeah, one after the other, not at the same time. So he's in prison forever. Can't we figure that out? Uh, this time, the police sent both a blood and semen sample from Chikatilo to be tested. Like last time, Chikatilo's blood came back as type A. But Chikatilo's semen sample came back as type AB. Uh, what? Matching the samples found on the victims. If they had tested Chikatilo's semen back in 1984, the police would not have dismissed him from their inquiries, and it's likely the man would have been caught much sooner, potentially saving 25 lives. Yeah, but if they're different types, they're different types. 
unless he's got that crazy disease which was in that episode of csi and i feel like it was another one of these maybe we've not covered it but where you're a chimera well like you have two types of blood you have two types of dna which is crazy Meanwhile, the inter interrogations were getting nowhere, and Chikatilo had revealed nothing to the police informer in his cell. The police had arrested Chikatilo on the 20th of November. They had 10 days where they could hold him without charge, after which they would have to charge him with something or let him go. On the 29th of November, Dr. Bukhanovsky, the criminal profiler who had five years earlier submitted his report on the Bostov Ripper, was invited to sit in on the interrogation. Bukhanovsky talked with Chikatilo for several hours, reading the Ripper, his 65-page psychological profile of him, moved to tears by Bukhanovsky's explanation for why he felt driven to commit the murders murders chikatilo confessed whoa he signed an official police document only a few hours before the police would have been forced to release him that's crazy wow that's great though trial and execution execution i know where i fall in my opinion on the death penalty on this one shoot him in the face while he was held in prison awaiting trial, Chikatilo admitted to 57 murders. He's one of the worst serial killers ever. Three of them he claimed to have committed between 1980 and 1982 in Shakti, which filled the gaps in the killer's supposed hiatus between his first murder in 1978 and the long gap after his second murder in 1981. But the murders have never been tied to any unsolved cases on missing persons. The fourth, Irina Pogoryelova, whom he had killed in 1986 and buried on a collective farm, was also disputed due to contaminated evidence and Chikatilo's deranged issuing and then withdrawing and reissuing of confessions. But the nature of the wounds on the victim fit Chikatilo's M.O. and made it overwhelmingly likely that he did it. Chikatilo also made several confessions and led the police to the remains of several bodies, tying him to a huge number of murders that the police were not even aware of. In total, over the course of his career as a serial killer, Chikatilo had committed an astonishing 53 to 57 brutal and gruesome murders. Jesus Christ. That is in the script. That is what David wrote. And on this page, David and I, everyone, everyone listening to this is on the same page. The trial began in April 1992 when the Soviet Union had fallen and the Russian Federation had risen in its place. This was to be the first trial of its kind in a newly democratized country. And for many people, it was a way of achieving some closure to a troubled Soviet past. <laughs> I mean, 57 murders and stuff is bad, but it's like, yeah, yeah, once we've done this, we can close the book on the Soviet Union. And I'm like, you guys remember Stalin, right? I mean, this guy might have killed 57 people. But Stalin? <laughs> he's, oh my god, he's responsible for millions of deaths. Chikatilo became symbolic of the dying days of the Soviet Union, with, sen with his senseless murders, the police incompetence, and their inability to stop a roving terror. It was representative of the wider problems pr plaguing Russian society at the time. By putting the case of the Rostov Ripper to rest, the Russian Federation was hopefully turning a new page in its history. The trial itself was a circus, which is perhaps symbolic of the current federation. It was abundantly clear that Chikatilo was guilty, and it would only take conviction on one or two murders to justify putting him to death. However, the presiding judge, Leonid Akubzanov, himself a holdout from the days of more authoritarian Soviet justice, was excessively accusatory and inquisitorial rather than staying impartial and letting the facts speak for themselves. Meanwhile, it appeared that Chikatilo's strategy was to behave as crazy as possible in order to escape being put to death. While being questioned, Chikatilo was frequently dismissive of the murders and evasive when it came to providing details. Instead, Chikatilo preferred to talk about his harsh childhood, or with a grim at the pained expression of his audience, going on nonsensical, disjointed rants about life and the state of the world. He'd deny charges, then admit to them, then deny them again. He'd shout over the judge and tell him to shut the f*** up so he could finish talking. The judge didn't help things by occasionally shouting back, Jake, telling Chikatilo, no, you shut the f*** up, and openly and baselessly accusing Chikatilo of not being insane. <laughs> oh my god, okay. <laughs> this is, I mean, Chikatilo is obviously the worst dude in the world, but this judge is also like, what are you up to, judge? Just be a good judge. Why don't shout at him? Just let him hang himself. Chikatilo would occasionally break out in maniacal laughter. He would sing songs. More than once, he got his c*** out and waggled it around the courtroom. Uh-oh. <laughs> While Chikatilo had never been a stable person, obviously, he was capable of more artifice than this. He had maintained a family facade and kept up a marriage for 26 years. He had hidden the fact that he was the Rostov Ripper for years too. He had managed to lure countless victims to their deaths by winning over their temporary confidence. He was not the raving loon he appeared to be in that courtroom. There is nothing to indicate that between his arrest and trial, the Chikatilo had mentally deteriorated. 
so it was likely a stratagem or perhaps with the mask having slipped and being caught bang to rights chikatilo felt he could simply be himself either way the russian press didn't care they were lapping the stuff up Despite his efforts, Chikatilo was sentenced to death, not an insane asylum. He appealed the decision to the Supreme Court, but it was rejected. He then appealed to President Boris Yeltsin to commute his sentence, and this was also rejected. No politician in his right mind would have humored him. Yeah. <laughs> even if you were the dictator, even if you were like absolutely in charge of Russia, no election's ever going to take you out, you'd still be like, yo, yo, yo. I still want people to vaguely think that I'm not a complete piece of shit. So, uh, absolutely not, you child murdering pedophile. On February the 14th, 1994, Chikatilo was taken from his cell, knelt in the middle of a soundproofed room, and was shot once behind the right ear. I hope this time Simon will agree with me when I say, may the bastard rot in hell and get f***ed by the ass of Satan's thorny c***. Yes, yes, actually, I mean, I guess I hope hell is real for this one. But it's also like, it's also good that there's just endless nothingness. Although then it's kind of sad because all of us end up with endless nothingness, and so does this dickhead. But at least they killed him. I'm so happy. Like, normally, I don't even know. Even if you disagree with the death penalty, you've got to be slightly satisfied with that, right? Like, that's a, that's a, that's deservant. He deserved that. Dismembered appendices. Apparently because this episode wasn't enough. <laughs> Number one, Chikatilo was not a master criminal, and he was never very good at cleaning up crime scenes, concealing bodies, or removing evidence. It seems like he barely even tried most of the time, only later when it seemed like the police were really trying to catch him. It was only by virtue of the sudden, ferocious rapidity of his murders, the randomness of his victims, and his consistent movement around the Soviet Union that allowed him to get away with things for so long. Back in 1978, when he committed his first murder with the slaying of nine-year-old Yelena Zakodnova, Chikatilo actually left behind a lot of evidence. Blood was found outside the house Chikatilo had bought in fraudulent circumstances, having dripped off the body as he carried it to the river. Multiple neighbors could describe Chikatilo and place him in the house that night. Yet another witness had seen a man of Chikatilo's description talking to Yelena at the bus stop. These witnesses described a middle-aged man, not a 25-year-old, like Alexander Kravchenko, who was arrested and eventually executed for the crime. Oh god, yeah, right back at the beginning that guy was executed for this and he was just innocent and they just forced him to confess because that's what the Soviet police were up to rather than the actual police work. Oh my god, I forgot how that is and that's extra sad. That guy's basically another victim. Bump it up to 58. All the police, uh, and also, I mean, he's also a victim of the goddamn police. All the police would have needed to do is investigate the house where the blood was found and they'd likely find forensic evidence of the murder committed there and then the hunt and then hunt down the house's owner all this could have been stopped back in 1978 instead the police in a rush to pin the murder on a likely local suspect collared and forced a confession out of an ex-con who lived in the area even then kravchenko was not going to be executed because the evidence was so thin but yelena's grief-stricken family protested loudly and publicly and in order to save face an innocent man was put to death while a monster walked free unbelievable Regardless of what you think of the death penalty, particularly for a piece of shit animal like Chakotillo, the wrongful execution of Alexander Kravchenko underlines the importance of due process and presumption of innocence before being proven guilty. The lesson seems all the more relevant in 2021 when rushing to ex uh, accuse someone of a crime and throwing the presumption of innocence out the window is becoming depressingly common again. Yeah, I mean, obviously not necessarily in the courts, but on like social media and stuff, it's like, yeah, 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 you did this. People will be like, yeah, yeah, you did it. And uh, people are like, wait, 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 what happened to like proving something first? And yeah, and then I think by the time the truth comes out or whatever, it's like people have forgotten and they don't care because it's not interesting and the press don't want to issue a retraction and all that stuff. It's savage. It's crazy. I, I blame Twitter. I I no, I blame Facebook. <laughs> Facebook's the worst, allegedly. Both in the public sphere and in social media, and even more troubly, troubly, troublingly in a few actual courtrooms in supposedly civilized countries. Really? I thought, I mean, in the courtrooms, they're usually pretty good about this, aren't they? They're not like, they don't, most of the time, no? How many generations are we going to have to spend learning the same lessons over and over again? This really is basic people. It sure is. Three, if Chikatilo had managed to do a better job on his entrance exams when he was 18, he may have won a scholarship to Moscow State University. Given his passion about politics at the time and his slavish devotion to the communist ideal, it's very possible that one of the worst serial killers in modern history would have obtained high office in the Soviet Union. There he would have been very good company alongside the likes of Leventry Beria. Oh my god, he's an absolute monster. I made a biographics video, another channel I do, where we do biogra biographies of people from history. 
Leventry Barrier was a crew, yeah. Nikolai Yezhov and Joseph Stalin himself, yeah. A bit of a rogues gallery there, isn't it? All of them were responsible for signing off on the deaths of millions of people on paper. Bear himself was known to relish in taking part firsthand on occasion, in addition to his systematic coercion and rape of thousands of Soviet women and girls over decades. It's monsters like these who thrive in a totalitarian system. Andrei Chikatilo would have been right at home. And it kind of makes you wonder what skeletons, perhaps literal skeletons, may be in the closets of some high-ranking officials in totalitarian regimes today. Oh, you can bet there are. Number four, the story of Andrei Chikatilo has inspired numerous fictionalized versions of his disgusting story in books and movies over the years. All of them have been instant trash. <laughs> I'm still waiting for a good one that is in the least bit introspective and not just trying to titillate the audience in the cheapest and most disgraceful of ways. Yeah, I mean, I really hope that with this show in general, I really try to stay away from the gloss. Like, there's, I don't know. There's some true crime stuff, which I feel is just like, this isn't very tasteful, is it, guys? Like, we shouldn't. And I know this is also, with this show, it's like, have a laugh about it. But I'm never laughing at the victims. And I re really try, like, and I don't think my natural personality leads to, like, laughing at the victims. But anytime, it's like, also, you know, you just don't do that. It's not appropriate. It's rude. It's disrespectful. Uh, I just want to be careful that this show doesn't do that. So just thinking about it today. I think like with this, I guess David's also aware of this and it's definitely something that you can do. Just that I try really hard not to because, uh, yeah, it's just, what, how, what does David say? Cheap and disgraceful. I would say so. Number five. While other serial killers have exceeded the record of Chikatilo's body count, particularly in the lawless wilderness of Colombia, the Rostov Ripper remains notorious for the brutality of his murders, effortlessly extended to continue to be repeated and create yet another damaged and grieving family for years despite living in a totalitarian society. The fact that in such systems innocent people's lives can be socially engineered and controlled to the microsecond but despite all the government control and intrusion such monsters are allowed to thrive while good people suffer is the ultimate condemnation of the totalitarian, utopian and social engineered ideal. Let liberty reign and let us all go to hell in our own way. Some of us might even stumble across a happy ending. That was a savage episode. Um, I don't think there's really any any other way to put that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I finish these and it's like, I should have done this the last thing in the day, shouldn't I? Because I was just going to be a bit bummed out. <laughs> anyway, this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, no one enjoyed this. This was horrible. But if you enjoy The Casual Criminalist as a show, <laughs> use that like button. Make sure you're subscribed. I feel dirty saying this. I shouldn't. <laughs> um also if you're enjoying it as a podcast please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts it is much appreciated and thank you for watching or listening i know people listen as well hello